Hey, yo, what's good? What's good? What's good? Welcome to Reflections of a DJ, the Road Podcast, presented by DJ City and Beat Source. I am one of your hosts, DJ Crooked. We have DJ Never here. Yo, what's up? We have Jamie the Great. Yeah. DJ D Miles is MIA. He's getting his ass fixed once again. Oh, once again. He's not here to join us, but we got a special episode. Um, on November 10th, we lost probably one of the most creative minds in DJing, very talented DJ, scratching, mixing abilities, innovative mixtapes was a staple voice in, on the radio for, for New York, has toured everywhere for, with Moby and even Russell Peters. Uh, rest in peace, DJ Spinbad. And, you know, here at the Road Podcast, we wanted to honor him and celebrate his life and um, hear about all the stories that, you know, I wanted to hear growing up in the 90s, growing up on his mixtapes and stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm very honored to have um, the homie XL here. We have DJ AV here and DJ Revolution. Thank you guys for coming through, man, and uh, yeah, helping, yeah. helping yeah, us yeah. with this tribute episode to Spin Bad, man. You know, going through his mixtapes, I, I, I've known, you know, never, we were talking about this for, for a while, mm-hmm. you know, when we were putting this episode together, just listening to his, uh, his mixtapes and just how he revolutionized the mixtapes in New York. He was ahead of, ahead of his time with the mixtapes. And I and I think you know like Jamie being from the West Coast and being you yeah. know, from from another generation, you're actually starting to listen and, and learn about it more right now, right? No, yeah. I mean, I, I for this episode and a little bit uh, after his passing, I went back and I started like just listening to all his stuff. Man, his uh, his volume two was probably untouched. Like his volume two for that '80s mix was crazy, and it's crazy mm-hmm. because I met Spinback briefly last year around this time. It was mad, mad short, but he was mad cool. And it, it just yeah. sucks seeing somebody like that pass and just good spirits. I, I mean, I was DJing at a restaurant and he was there eating, but he was giving me props. And I was just like, oh, shit. Like, that's I, I know who he was through Russell Peters and all the specials, but going back and, and learning about his legacy, man, it's, it's, it's crazy as fuck. I wanted to kind of go into, I mean, he had 24 mixtapes, two albums. You know, uh, I think Revolution, AV, you guys worked with him uh, on a few mixtapes, right? Yeah, mixtapes and um, both of my albums that were um, that were released and uh, various other projects here and there. AV, you were part of, I guess, the first Rock the Cash Bar. Yeah, that was actually on actual cassette back in the day. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the story behind that alone is just crazy. Um, I mean, the whole, the whole intent of that whole mixtape was basically we used to, you know, drive back and forth to... You know, do road trips like to Philly to meet up with you know Jazzy Jeff, and we just wanted to. He just wanted to like make something cool to listen to, like on some road shit. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. he kept on coming up with these crazy ideas, and it got to a point where he had so many of these these mixes together, and it was like, I wonder if I made this, if I made a mixtape, people buy this. It was like, it was just it, the intent wasn't really to change the game the way he did with that composition, you know. And it just really just flipped the whole game around where you realize, yeah, these songs had a little quirkiness about them, but the way he murdered those songs, it, just, yeah. it made the composition itself just stand alone. Never, yeah. never and I were talking about just mixtapes in general in the, like in the eighties going into the nineties. I mean, you had like the kick Capri's that kind of, that was really like, a, the kick Capri's was like a party mixtape. Right? right. And it was like, it was, uh, it was always pretty much live. Like in some, in a lot of kick Capri mixtapes, you can hear the needle skipping, you know, and it, it's a lot of mic work. Like he's party rocking. And then it kind of, it moved to like the Ron G clue era. Right. And I remember people were, they were ridiculing Ron G for not scratching. And yeah. I remember he was just mixing. It just blends. Just just does blending, blend. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then, listening to like rock the cash bar i think it was in 94 95 when that shit came out like that just completely like blew my mind it was like i've never heard anyone take like cheesy pop 80s and make it into hip-hop like he just he made everything sound like hip-hop to me like you know like he just he presented it in such a way that was like hip-hop i mean yeah definitely because the obviously the mixtape climate back then was like you mentioned crew ron g yeah you know the pre-selection and you know he took it in the direction where it's like okay these guys want to use the mic for the transitions he just made it 100 percent dj skill and um yeah didn't think it was going to have a marketable you know it was going to be marketable in the mixtape world because everybody wants to buy that crap but he created a whole lane where like him revolution babu like those 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 compositions they ended up just creating a whole, a whole lane of just you guys want to talk, but these guys want to do this over here. Well, when I was growing up on the East Coast, man, when, uh, right before I came out to Cali, there was a there was a little bit, there was like a year or two where the New York and Jersey mixtape guys 
started to actually branch off and do that really creative shit. Like, there's a bunch of dudes that I used to fuck with. That there's this dude named Ju Ice out of Jersey. Yes, yes. And, um, and then there was a couple of other dudes that were really like uh, there was Shame out of uh, you know what's the mask? That's my my man right there. And so like when those guys. He was spin was in their lane and they were in his lane because it was all about the DJ. No matter what they were doing, whether it was like chopping up breaks, you know, um, you know how Riz did, uh, you know, the live from Brooklyn shit mm -hmm. and all that stuff, you know, like that, that kind of stuff. That's where I was when I left the East Coast to come out to Cali. That's where my mentality, that's what, that's the type of mixtapes I was making. And so I didn't even hear spin bads. I lived on the East Coast my whole life and i never heard one spin bad mixtape until i got out here to the west coast wow i got i got out here on uh, 95 i want to say like late summer of 95 and a mutual friend of ours buys one introduced me to spin bad's mixtapes because this is a funny story that nobody knows except me buys and spin is that I, you know when i got out here he had that 80s mixtape, the first one, The Rock the Casbah, I had never heard it before. And then I did a mixtape that's, uh, you know, like it buried somewhere in my basement, but it has the same, almost the exact same identical hip hop versus rap remix. Yeah, on remember it, that shit. We, yeah. didn't know each, we didn't know each other. I never spoke to this man. I, I never heard one of his mixtapes. He probably never heard one of my mixtapes because we were still on the come up. You know, he had a lot more weight going because he was he was in New York and I was, um, you know, I was up, up north around boston so we we were ex we we're on the same level 100 percent creatively without even knowing each other and the skills you know were, were were balanced and when i i heard this shit it blew my, it's the same thing that happened to buys buys was like yo wait a minute you don't know about spin bad well how the fuck did you how did you get his remix on your shit i was like yo that's not his that's that's mine that's <laughs> i don't know him. i don't know him yo i don't i don't know him he's like but yo this is almost exact there was the difference was a few samples like the way he flipped up a few of those uh vocal samples like he might have had the acapella version of it come in and i had the instrumental dropped underneath it or some something very uh, very subtle. It was just wild how we didn't know each other. This guy knew both of us and Bias connected us. And that's how we linked up instantly. And we were just friends from that point on because we just, we were on that same wavelength. But, you know, back to the New York mixtape um, scene, I think, you know, that generation, you know, that is where the creativity spawned into making more I don't know. It's, it's where almost it started to separate. Like AB was saying, like you got like the guys that want to talk shit on the mic and then that evolved into the mm -hmm. DJ dramas and all that. And then you got the creative shit, which separated from hip hop and turned into some scratch nerd shit. There used to be a middle lane and that was the creative side of the mixtapes. And that's where, you know, we all fit as far as, you know, people like me, Spin, AB, and, and, you know, everybody was coming out with trying to do innovative shit. You know, even Tony Tush was, just, he was like, man, you know, he was yeah. never on some serious creative shit, but he was like, yo, I got my lane. I'm going to fit in with these 50 MCs joints. Mm -hmm. And you tuned in for that. And it wasn't just yeah. some dude shouting out somebody's man on the record. Like, yo, you know, pick up Queens, you know. Right. And it was the first time, like, we kind of heard like a really layered production on a yeah, mixtape, right? I was about to say, like, multi track yeah. recording of a mixtape is such an art form. Yeah. That takes so much work, mm -hmm. especially at that level. Yeah. In the beginning, anyway. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even if you're doing it and you know it and you can punch in and punch out, if you're trying to do that for a full mix, and stack all these layers yeah, yeah. you know what i mean like it's nobody it's, does it <laughs> yeah it's it's a good amount of work to do but when you get that finished piece yeah it stands there's not it's like, incredible no, yeah i mean yeah, I yeah. Saying, it just stands the test of time like it is never you it, it will yeah. live forever yeah as a piece of art and where yeah. if you just play in records the mixtape dies when those records die, you know? Yeah, for sure. You can flip it, like Spin flipped those 80s joints uh -huh. in the 90s and the 2000s and all that shit, how he was yep. doing it, and continue to do, you know, what he did best. That's why those things will live forever. But that's, again, to me, that's why I needed to have him on my records because I'm, I'm the same way. That's why I fucked with this guy because he had that same mentality. He's like, if I'm going to do this shit, I'm going to do it completely my way. And I'm gonna do it to death. So, yeah. so when someone approached you about you ripping off the spin bad mix, right? Did you were you like what happened? Were you like I gotta reach out to this dude or or what? No, so no, no one. It wasn't like yo, you, yo, you bit this guy's shit. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of like it was kind of like that because he didn't know. You know, Bibes was a record promoter at the time, yeah, and uh, and also still a DJ, but um, 
he didn't know me like that. So he was a step into me like, yo, you, why you bit my man shit? Mm-hmm. It was like, yo, this is really bugged out because it, was, it wasn't like a ripoff. It was like yeah. almost identical. It just turned into this conversation where it's like, how can you not know this? You don't know him. He doesn't know you guys didn't right. do this together. You didn't put this yeah. together yourselves on two separate coasts. Um, because Bias didn't even know that I was from the East Coast. It's very, it's very complicated because mm-hmm. I really had just landed on on the West Coast almost yeah. a year before that. Well, Ooh. plus back back then, back in the nineties, coast to coast was a world apart. You yeah, know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like especially on the mixtape. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't just hear what was going on. Someone had to get it across the United States yeah, yeah. to you, you know what I'm saying? So it wasn't like, yo, you bit my man's uh, <laughs> right, song, right, you know what I'm saying? Right, like, right. you know what I mean? It, it was, yeah, like that was, was the last very, thing you thought of, you know? It was very uh, funny, and this I'll never forget it. You know, I was in somebody's office, and I was on the phone with Bias, and then he got spin on the phone that same conversation. He was like, hold up, man, I need to call this dude right now. Yeah. And we got introduced that day when, through that conversation. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, it's just really wild how it happened. It's awesome to me because, like, that just – it was like, yo, we, it was, we were destined to be homies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was I, – I wanted to, like, talk about just the layered mixtape and the four track because when I was growing up, like, I was trying to feel – like, I remember me and my boys would listen, like, yo, how is he doing this? Is he – is he on yeah. four turntables? Is he on three turntables? You know? Well, the first part is that for the 80s um, Casbah, yeah. yeah, he was on you know, a four track, but yeah, like like Rev said, we were on the come up, so, you know, he didn't have the finest equipment. So his four right. track actually had a broken track. Mm-hmm. So he was working with like three tracks. Mm-hmm. All this bouncing around was happening, and he would have to like kind of That's fake it from tracks. And, you know, he was handicapped with this four track that was supposed to be helpful. Yeah, but he made magic out of that shit. Man. Yeah, was, you know, yeah. I feel like that was an edge, and that is still an an edge that is something I can pull out of my toolkit at any time, no matter what's going on with, no matter what genre of music, and use that. And there's, like you said, people have no idea what the fuck is happening when I'm flipping all these layers and doing all this scratching, and it all really stems from, you know, when the first time I think we all really started hearing this, and it wasn't on a mixtape, it was on records, you know, when, mm-hmm. you know, Magnificent Jazzy Jeff came out and he had, like, shit flying all around, like, four different scratches over a drum beat. I was like, yo, how is this even possible? <laughs> <laughs> this is this is insane. What is happening? It blew my mind. And then even going back to when Grandmaster Flash did on the wheels of steel, he had like to mention that one. Yeah, yeah, he had like three or four different things going at the same time with a vocal snippet, two beats playing at the same time, scratching on something. I was like, what the fuck is what is this? And so I think when we all heard that and we were all in such our formative years, it was like. Uh, you know, revelation. And we just were like, yo, I need to learn how to do that because that's where it's going. That's the next, you're using all the technology because we're all tech nerds, you know, and we got to, you know, dip our hands in whatever new technology is coming out. And spin was the same way too, you know, perhaps not as, as, you know, he's probably more middle of the spectrum than I was because I'm just diving into all this new shit. But again, utilizing the multi-tracks, digital vinyl systems, computers, all that shit. And like AV was saying with the four tracks, Spin had, I guess if Spin had the uh, the four track with the broken, I had a six track. I had a Fostec six track with a broken track. So I had a five, I had a five track. <laughs> AV, what was, what was, uh, you were included on the Rock the Cash Bar, you know, it said featuring AV on the mix. What was your hand in that mix? Um, Yeah, they, like him, him and JS did a great deal of the, they did most of the work. But like yeah. there was some, there was some scratches, like open-ended scratches that he was like, yo, throw some in here so you could kind of be part of the whole composition. But like a lot of people don't know, I actually designed the cover. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And I did most of Stim Bath's artwork, like, you know, throughout his entire career, you know, so. Wait, like so like, eight- like at that time, were you using Photoshop or what were you using? Yeah, Photoshop, Quark Express. Um, and I mean, you know, at that time I worked at Kinko, so I'd have to work my shift. And then after hours, I'd be on the computer because I didn't have my own computer. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> And then I did a lot of the, the Fat Beast mixtape covers too, and oh, that's non-fiction. Dope. And I mean, if you ever see the logo of Designs, that's pretty much my 
my graphic alias. So were you were you also printing like uh, CD covers and mixtape covers on the side and yeah. stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just never stopped, hey, bro, you know? a good mixtape DJ always had the inside man. That's the right. Side. That's you right. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> you gotta have the FedEx or Kinko's plug. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, all the guys in the H and or dinner or whatever, and they'll print up all your shit. You know, yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, it was always kind of like a side deal. I remember that, like making mixtapes or printing flyers. You always had someone who worked at some printing company or Kinko's. Yep. And and you hit him on the side and get him. You know, oh, we had a Kinko's plug. Yeah. Oh, that's how I met Lord Finesse because I was a you know employee at Kinko and he came in. He wanted to get his mixtape cover done and I was like, yeah, they really don't do that here, but you know I do this after hours. You know, so he kind of came back at midnight and then you know yep. I kind of did the work for him and ever since then I've been doing like his artwork and. But the Jazzy Jeff's logo. I mean, it's, oh, shit. it's yeah. kept going. Oh, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, and 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 like Rub was saying, they'd print you out a sheet with like six covers on it. You yeah. just have to go to the little paper cutter <laughs> and be in there <laughs> 12, 12, 30, 1 in the morning. You know they what I mean? Cutting up your mixtape covers. Stuff them in the ju- in the jewel cases. I used to do that. Yeah, horrible. Did you guys used to shrink yeah. wrap your shit too, or no? I was, nah, that, that, that was some next level. Need some drama yeah. boy. Yeah, you need drama <laughs> boy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People have said, like it's been said, this is the most bootlegged mixtape of all time. The Rock yeah. the Cash Ball. Can you explain the I buzz? Can, that, that. C- can you explain the buzz that we're going? Does that mean that in New York, when they were selling bootlegs on the blankets on the street, yeah. you would see that? I mean, that's, a lot of people didn't know about the cover because a lot of people got a copy of a copy of a copy. Mm-hmm. So it was just being passed around like that because the shit was like so, yo, this is goofy, man. Yo, I got to hear this. So they would just share it to people. But I mean, it was available at Fat Beats, which one of the actual packaging and all that. But um, yeah, it got, you know, got dubbed and copied by a lot of people. And they just, it just developed legs on its own. Like, no one was going to go that crazy. And and, and was this the first time, was this the beginning of an era where DJs could solely make a living off of mixtapes? I mean, I think the other guys were doing already, like the clues and stuff like that. But yeah. This kind of gave an opportunity where, like, all right, best example, I had tape in the car because, again, it was just a road It was just a road tape for us. Yeah. And then I don't know if you guys are familiar with DJ Eclipse from Fat Beats. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, he told the story on the show, um, and he was telling me how, like, he reminded me how, like, we were in the car one day, and I had the tape playing, and he was, like, the manager slash buyer for Fat Beats, and he heard the tape playing, and he was like, yo, what is this shit? And then, like, after the car ride was over, he heard the whole tape. He was like, yo, I need this tape, you know? And that kind of, like, sparked it to be in the Fat Beats, you know, chain of tapes that are being sold, you know, all over the world to the point where, like, Japan will call up and, like, yo, we need 600, we need 1,000. It was like... That's it crazy. just became way yeah. bigger than you ever actually saw was, thought it was gonna be. I'm, dope, I'm so man. fascinated by how that whole mixtape era because it was like it was it was like running to me it was like running like drugs to me. It was, it was like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah to legal. a certain degree, you yeah. know what I mean? But at, at at the same time, like for some of us, that was that was like, yo, I made it. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. when I started doing mixtapes, and I'm talking about cassettes, I would sell them in high high school, you know, and you'd buy a box of blank tapes and you would dub them at home and you would just sell them 10 bucks a tape. Your markup was great because a blank cassette costed maybe a dollar, you know? And uh, and just a feeling of like your homies listening to what you were putting out. And the, the, the bubble was so small. It was just that, you know? From that, it grew. And then I started to be able to put mixtapes in like the record stores downtown, which now it's like, yo, I really made it. Now like the city is hearing it, you know? And they would buy them from you or you would con- consign them, whatever deal you could work out or however you were doing, which was great because you were able to sell them on your own, plus sell them to the store. You were able to make make more, your profit changed and all that other stuff. It was huge because the you know, your your scope back then was just like, I'm on now, you know? Yeah, you and can, it, it you just, can go yeah. uh, at the end of the week and you can make your runs and pick yeah. up your money. Yeah, and, yeah. But yeah. but the thing is though, I think what changed it, you know, even just to revert back to what A V was saying, is when people were actually expressing so much interest, they were ordering shit from out of state. I was yeah. cool just running around my, my local little circle, my city. Yeah. Right. Picking up my couple hundred bucks yeah. a week and then reinvesting it and doing I was young, you know. I didn't yeah. I mean I have a I didn't have a family or obligations and shit. So I was I was just yeah. cash on top of what I was gigging with. Yeah. So um but then you know, you go, you do the runs, and then as as time went on, people the the game kind of exploded exponentially, yeah. and then people from out of town started asking to order the shit, and you're like, order it. 
The fuck you mean order it? I'm not <laughs> order it. Yeah. What do you mean? I mean I gotta mass produce the shit now? That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. And my problem yeah. was that I never really, you know, I wasn't prepared for it. And I, I and then I moved and just, you know, I went to LA. But I, I, that shit is still in me. And that that hustle really helped me when I moved out here because nobody out here in LA was moving like that. There was the mixtape yeah. shit was not even no not even going like that out here. So I would mix, run around. The mixtape shit in LA just blew up in the mid two thousands. Yeah, and by then yeah. it was crap anyway. So uh, yeah, it was it was it was really watered down by that CDs point. By then, right? Yeah, it was it was yeah. CDs and it was it was your your go to guys like the Clue and the and the Envies and shit like that, the Desert Storm days. But yeah, yeah, that's how I would get mixtapes and mix CDs. But it wasn't close to what you guys are talking. What you guys are talking about is fucking amazing, and I'm kind of so jealous. Dope, man. You no, know I have a yeah. question. I'm kind of curious. Like when you saw um, give your your tapes to the um record stores, how many tapes did you give them? It depends how well you did if they knew you and what they wanted to take. Obviously, they wanted to take what they could sell. So if they knew your joints flew off the shelf, they would take more. They would take, you know, 20, 50, 100, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, depending on what level you're at. Because they got to be able to stock them. That, if yeah. you were consigning them and they didn't have to give you any money as you dropped the tape off or the C CD off, you could leave whatever you want, you know what I mean? But it, at that point, you know, like... I don't know. I think I was probably doing, I would probably press up a few hundred, you know, and then I kept some for myself and I always had them on, on me because yeah. it was an easy sell. You know what I mean? Cause you really didn't have a lot of choices to listen to dope music mixed, right? You either had to record all for the radio and take all that time and then take it with you, or you just had to buy it. You couldn't, there was no internet. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Or you had to listen to just full tapes, like full albums that you would buy. Right. So this had everything on it. And for 10, 10 bucks, it was easy, you know? So it, it, it was fun to do, man. It's just the options were a lot less. You know what I mean? There wasn't so much music available for people mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah. Out here, so when I got out here and I realized what was going on, it really wasn't too much uh, room for the mixtape thing. It had had picked up enough and then it really again they were back in the mid 2000s and went to the cds i started pressing up cds and doing the same shit that i was doing almost 10 years ago and it worked i would go all up and down uh melrose to where all the record shops were i would go all up and down vermont all these little shops and i would you know i was back on my bullshit you know mm -hmm. like like it never like it never stopped but yeah. my production game had upped another level my you know the graphics and all that stuff and i wanted to make it look really professional because man back 10 years before man let's be honest you know a couple of cardboard pieces of paper and some some whack-ass graphics got the job done yeah i just <laughs> graffitied on mine and i just threw it in the drone or put a sticker on it or something right exactly <laughs> some, crooked, some crooked label uh, you know the shit that came with the tape yeah on yeah, the yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah but you know but when it came to cds man you had to press it up so that meant you had to know somebody at a yep. pressing plant get the best rates shipping cases you uh, had to pay for the cases to artwork set. like it yep. was like a full-on production and it really changed the way i looked at everything it helped me learn and, mm -hmm. and grow but um i think people who kept the foot on their foot on the gas on the mixtape um scene really whether you put out records or were touring or whatever it was you still had a foot in the door people still fucked with you if you did it well it's such a key element or a cornerstone of this that we all do that is often overlooked until you know somebody like spin comes up missing in the game and it's like oh wow okay man then you look back at what he was a part of and how he helped push all that to the forefront and, and kind of elevate it and do what we did you know i wish motherfuckers were ordering a thousand of my mixtapes from japan back then you know, I mean, it, was was huge, was, it was crazy because he um again like it became overwhelming to the point where like he did it he tried to fulfill orders but they kept on coming in to the point where like he was doing a regular double cassette deck he had to invest in that. Remember the Telex machine? Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That changed the whole sweatshop factor where he was able to crank out yeah. a little bit more quicker, but he had to buy a second Telex. And then JS had his Telex, and you would be able to daisy chain those, yeah. and you could kind of get more cranked out. It's like, a lot of work, man. Yeah, it was it's slow fun. work, too. I used to actually bring my tape deck to work in the basement, keep it in the break room, and just like make copies in the basement. And, uh -huh. Oh, that sounded real familiar. <laughs> you know, the orders coming in, but it was just a lot of... It was definitely fun, though, because you yeah. felt like, yo, this shit is moving. I might be yeah, doing yeah. something. Now, it, I don't know. Now you don't really get that feeling. I guess maybe when you upload a joint and you feel like there's a lot of plays behind it but 
Nah, it's man. just like you could never you could yeah. tell whether it's a play or a click like oh this right shit, like, I'm right, right, right. Like, yeah. so, it's just a feeling of starting with a stack of tapes of uh, discs and then ending yeah. up with nothing you're mm-hmm. like i yes. started with something i got nothing everyone has them right and some money to what you're you know. saying to, to, to your point is that like yo if somebody put ten dollars on it they invested or even for five dollars right. there's money right spent. now you got to give it there's, away there's yeah. a business yeah. transaction that happened yeah. from you know a handoff and yeah. somebody who gave you five dollars is gonna damn sure go home and listen to that shit right. and if yeah. they don't, they're gonna keep listening and they're gonna put it in their collection and they're gonna look at it yeah mm-hmm. it's like a record and that that does not happen anymore no nah, man um nah. no matter who you are or what you're doing right you gotta put uh physical um product out in order for that to happen yeah and i feel like the 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 generation a couple generations before ours and a couple generations after ours got uh, and still are getting a peek into what that meant and we're reminded of that when we're talking about spin bad because you know he's part of that that i don't know what that that time capsule that we all living in and yeah Man, it's just uh, you can't get it anymore. So it, it's it's like no SoundCloud mixes what, what the what the, what is that? Right. What is that? Yeah. No, yeah. I mean that's what I felt about like when he did the the two thousand mega mix. I mean that shit was incredible. But that was around the time when downloads and sh- you know streaming started to come in. Yeah, and it wasn't the same satisfaction like Excel mentioned where yeah you got a stack of blanks and you got a stack that's heading out the door. You know what I'm saying? And it's yeah. actual physical tangible people having. A tangible yeah. item, or someone can come up to you at a gig and hand you the mixtape, and you got to sign it. Yeah, That's crazy. how rad yeah. is that, yo? Because no, I mean, I can't even, I can't even tell you, man. So I did a mixtape the first time I went to Australia on, on the tour. It was in like I don't even know what year it was, but it was like two thousand something. And I did a whole, you know, Rev goes down under mixtape with a fucking crocodile done deep. Me wrestling a crocodile on the, <laughs> of the cover and shit. <laughs> and, uh, yo, I, I, we sold, we sold it out at every at every venue, and we were pressing more down in Australia while we were moving from city to city it wasn't a lot but it was like a couple hundred here a couple hundred there and yo that's huge though you know the next year for australia that's pretty good but the next time i came back and matter of fact the next two or three times i came back this is what people brought to the gigs as merch to have me sign it wasn't my album which was already getting critically acclaimed and was like you know this piece of dj history even that early on nobody was bringing that shit they were bringing my fucking rev goes down under (laughs) mixtape you know what i mean and so when i signed the same thing when i went to japan um i did a mixtape called the way of the samurai and people would show up with that for me to sign not my albums. Yeah, I used to sell mixtapes at the club every night I would play, you know? And it was just a way to make a little bit more money. It was it was just easy, you know? And it was the best, like, business card you could ever give anyone, yeah. you know what I mean? Because this is this is what it is, so. It's so funny how I've, all the DJs come out with a mixtape and they have to become, like, a distribution company. I mean, I was DJing for Master Ace for a little while and. You know, he had his merch as Master Ace, whatever. So I had to slip in something at that merch table. Yeah. And what it was, it was the mixtapes. You know what I'm saying? And people were asking us to sign that. And there were some cities like, yeah, where I ran out of product and we'd have to go to the little sweatshop and crank out some more. You know, I had, you know, the, you had the laptop with a CD burner. So I had to crank out some more from the laptop, you know, but it kept me, you know, kept the money flowing while I was on the road. I have a, I have a question. When the first Rock the Cash Bar came out, it took a while to get the second, uh, the 80s part two, the Mega Mix part two, right? But there right. was like, there was a span of like a like a two years or so where, was he just focusing on the distribution of that Rock the Cash Bar mixtape? Some of it, yeah, some of it was like, yeah, it was just trying to just fulfill the orders that kept on coming in. Wow. But him and, him and Jeff also had other projects too. Um they had like you know battle records and stuff like that. They were also trying to get done. Mm-hmm. Um, we also kept busy aside from just cranking our mixtapes too. So looking at the time, I think he did also the the sound bombing with the raucous people. Mm-hmm. But he, he always kept busy. It wasn't just you know just the mixtape hustle that was you know. I was too young for the clubs. Was was spin bad in the clubs at all? Um, later on, I mean, like if it was like a, maybe a fat beats type of event where it was like right. you know real hip hop true stuff every so often. But again, those those parties also had their favorites that they wanted to hire. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe Clark Kent or you know whoever. But um, when it definitely when he he really made his mark when he got into like commercial radio, he just yeah he got hired to do Z one hundred. But the way he did those Z one hundred mixes with the right the cheesiest records known to mm-hmm. man backstreet boys britney and all that kind of shit but he still murdered it you know what i'm saying with yeah acapella yeah. layers and instrumentals and all that kind of shit that plus that know. shit was like a syndicated show it, w- it would 
Yes. You would hear him in like random cities around the United States, which was really dope. You know what I mean? And then he connected with Big Tigger, who was also a major, you know, major guy because he was connected with BET and he he had his own syndicated show and he was Tigger's DJ, which that show itself was also syndicated nationwide. Like, so in the 2000s, I remember there was kind of a, there was a beef, right? There was this beef between Spinbad and Flex, right? Oh, that was amazing. That was great. Oh my so, God. So like, I'm just, you no, know, I'm just hearing about this yesterday. Chris. Oh, it's yeah. so good. Oh my God. I got I to gotta find that mix. Oh my but God. I, I never, I forgot where it stemmed from because I know that Spinbad was at Z100 and Z100 was like a top 40 pop radio station. They would play some hip hop that crossed over, but it was mainly like top 40 pop music. Yeah, it was like CHR, like crossover rhythmic or whatever right. it's called, right? Riff? And then Hot 97 where F- Funk Flex was, Funk Master Flex was. That was just like raw ass fucking hip hop. Not so much raw, not so much raw. Well, well it was hip hop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In post 2000, it wasn't at raw anymore. It was just I mean, it, like was, it, was, it was hip hop. And then I don't yeah. know where the beef stemmed from. I'm sure it had to do with the, the radio station shit. Well, but I mean, it first kicked off where like Hot 97 itself was it was a different station it was like uh almost like a freestyle station where you would hear Mm -hmm. um noel you know sweet sensation all that kind of stuff right and then that's what was hot 103 and then when it moved to hot 97 that's when they hired flex and flex was just a friday saturday night guy and then when they saw the momentum that his show was having you know obviously things got bigger and better for hot 97 Mm -hmm. and also his you know he kind of got a little bit more feeling himself a little more (laughs) yeah he was feeling himself let's yeah use his words he was feeling himself and then z100 gets you know Z100 and 105 gets spin bad and he's wrecking shit and he's starting to throw the Hot 97 ratings off, mm. you know, with his mixes. So Flex has to, you know, show that he's the tough guy. You know, he runs New York crap, you know. So he, he used to throw shade at anybody who was Hot 97's competitor. Like, who was it? Um, There was a couple of DJs that came in and out of town and he would always try to, like, give them a hard time. And Spin Bad was the guy that, yeah, he'd give him a hard time, but he basically kicked back. And that mix that he kicked back with, man. Wow. Yeah. That's <laughs> For, like, radio sense, that that was really dope. Plus, I think, I, I think in just good fun of radio, whether it was serious or not, it just... It gave people something to talk about, you oh, know, yeah. because Flex was very mouthy with his being the number one. And by all means, at, at, at a good point in time in New York radio, Flex was the the dude, you know. Yeah. But everyone knew Flex only had words to go against Spin. And Spin isn't a guy that's going to sit there and talk. He's yeah. going to put it all down on wax. So it's like, how do you... What's going to be your rebuttal when I just put this crazy DJ turntable heavy response back to whatever you're you're talking? <laughs> you know what I mean? And all you can do is just keep talking, but you can't do nothing on the wheel. So it's just... It, it was awesome, man. I love Radio Beast. I think it might have been a couple of weeks ago. I was going on this Boom Bap Mondays thing on Twitch. And, oh, yeah. With yeah. Uh, DJ yeah. Fly and Audio One, right? Yeah. So yeah. somebody played that in the beginning of their set or the end of their set. And then... Oh, really? I was like, man, I hadn't, I hadn't heard that since... Uh, man, uh, he called me right before that was about to... He was putting it together. And he was a little, he was a little funky about it. He was like, "Man, I, yo, should like, should I do this? Like, sh- should I go at this guy, man? Like, I yeah. don't know." Yeah, because that was our deal at that point. Yeah, yeah. I, I hear, I, you know, and I kind of had a little bit of sense of how, because we used to, me, you know, uh, me and everybody that worked at the beat, all my guys, we used to go at everyone that worked at Power One Hundred Six, and we had this radio beat, but it was, you know, front, more more or less friendly competition. So I kind of had some insight into how that worked, and he wanted to pick my brain about it. Obviously, it was a very different situation because, you know, Flex is whatever. He's a goof, you know, to be honest with you. At, at, yeah. at least he was at that point. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, he, he was really, you know, just asking for like, you know, little bits of insight and like what, you know, what would happen if I did this or how far should I go? Like how, how far should I really try and take it? And you know me, I was like, take that shit all the way. <laughs> all the way. All the way. You know? Suckers step and me. They want to get some. But I'm spin bad. So yo, you know the outcome. For you to beat me, it's going to take a mirror like a big dumb pit bull. And get some. Like 11. That's right, you washed up old fat guy. This is DJ Spin Bad. And if you want to settle this, man, I'll battle you whenever and wherever you want, man. No microphones, just DJ skills. I'll even come up to your little house in, uh, where do you live, Dobbs Ferry? Just make sure your friends are there to see you get abused, man. Maybe afterwards I'll let you carry my records if you're not still carrying Chuck Chill out. Chill out, chill out, chill out. I mean, yeah, New York, New York radio is definitely a, uh, not really a kumbaya thing. So 
like the whole like yeah the the radio station beefs it will go to a certain level obviously like with magic and red alert you know it was friendly competition but when it got to the flex world you know they were knuckleheads not so much flex but right. the knuckleheads but he had people around him that yeah, around him real. would take it to the next level because he actually i remember spin after that got played he was doing a club and then flex kind of sent a dude to where he was spinning at to kind of like not really see him on some violent shit, but just like whisper in his ear, like, yo, Flex knows where you're at right now. Almost on some, it, it got, it got, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but actually one time when Spin actually retaliated with, I think with another mix, you know, Flex came back on some like, yo, man, come on, this is just some WWF shit, man. It doesn't have to get that serious. <laughs> because I think Spin really went, like Rev mentioned, he really went far with something. Yeah. And I don't know if I could really mention it here or not, but, um, Let's just say he kind of he really got close to Flex, and Flex came back to him on some like, "Yo, bro, yo, come on, man, this is just WWF shit, man. You know, this, you know, easy back a little wow. bit." You know, all, I didn't know that. He, really? Well, off the I mean, I, off the record, I gotta hear what it was though. Can we? Right, yeah. we edit this? Can we just hear? <laughs> uh, almost on some like Jay Z and super ugly shit. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Sure, yeah. sure. I remember like when Flex was on the radio, it just sounded so crazy because he was just like shitting on Spin Bad. So. Yeah. Him and them big Dennis were on the mic, just talking so much. They were just talking so heavy. It was man. so yeah. heavy. Yeah. He was like, you know, yeah. you know, Flex. He's like, you're not in the clubs. You're not in the yeah. streets. Yo, spin bag, you're so whack. You're so whack, and you're trying to do. T- how could you be whack on two stations? You're so whack. But that's so funny, right? Because you you, you gonna keep poking the bear, and then and then the bear goes in, and now you want to back off. He's still, he's still doing that shit. <laughs> he still does, does it. Day. Listen, I, I I get it, and that's and that's flex, and that's everything that he's been, and that's what people want to hear from flex. You know, you don't want to hear him calm. You want to hear him talk that shit. Got to be careful with the people you go at you know what i mean because yeah. not everybody's going to take it on some show shit you know how was spin bad as a as a dude like even handling this situation was was he letting it get to him was he angry like what was his temperament nah, like he just asked questions you know like of, of people that were in his immediate circle i think back then he was a little bit more outgoing when it came to you know stuff like that you know later on i don't know if anything was going on like that really of that magnitude because that was some like real heavy shit yeah. right there but mm-hmm. to be honest with you he was just ask questions you know like hey man what, what you think what do you think about this uh, what, here's the situation or like yo uh sh- should i you know should i do it this way or that way i mean it wasn't he wasn't rattled he would be like yo i want to tear this motherfucker up. you know <laughs> but, but but again he recognized it he had to blend the hip-hop with the professionalism and the hip-hop side is like i'm about to tear this dude up mm-hmm. But also, he's on a radio. He's representing a major radio station. Yeah, you got to be really before. careful how, how you and step. You get booted yeah. right off the air for doing stuff like that because the yep. GMs and the PDs, they don't give two shits about whatever street beef you got going on. Uh-huh. If you bring it to the airwaves, that's a problem. And, I, you know, we had that situation happen at the, at the beat and power out here regularly. So, you know, I was familiar with that. So, you know, when he would ask shit like that, I would have those type of insights. But it, he never, you know... It wasn't like it ever bothered him. It was fun to him. It was all fun. Like yeah. it would be fun to any yeah. one of us. Like it's, this yeah. is what we, you know, if you come from that, that, that core, that battle core, that DJ core, that comes with the package. Yeah. You live that, for that shit. Yeah. yeah. You, I dare. Yeah. I, I, I wish you would do something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And especially for spin at that time, it just adds so much attention because people still listen to the radio. You know what I mean? So people were talking about this, even in Philly, like it traveled all the way down to Philly. Wow. And we knew about it. So people would, you would wait to hear somebody would record it. They'd post it someplace and you'd be able to Mm -hmm. hear it. And it just put, you know, that many more people uh, familiar with spin, you know, because flex, if you got someone on this other radio station talking about you all day long, it's like, yo, this is great. This is something, this is promo I can't pay for, you know, Mm -hmm. and all you got to do is just deliver the way you would. And then it's like, let's, let's, let's keep this thing going. You know what I mean? Yeah. Obviously we're still talking about it right now. So it's still, yeah. yeah, (laughs) Was he, was he kind of like a jokester or prankster? Because I mean, if you really listen to the Casbah, there's so many subliminals. Yeah. What is it? The uh, Karma Chameleon's playing. Yeah. yeah. He says, I'm a man. And he has a slick Rick saying, I know you're not. <laughs> Part of his the way his brain worked. It was just like, I'm gonna give you DJ Madness, but at the same time, here's the sarcasm, here's the layers of, mm-hmm. you know, the movie clips, yeah. all kind of shit. I mean, yeah. That's definitely- a, again, that's exactly why on those songs that are on my albums, there was nobody else that could do 
that on that level, you know, yeah. exactly what AV's talking about. Like there's, I, I admit, I'm a student of this game and there's nobody who I could let loose the same way on right. and they could give it back. Yeah. I was like, when I, when I stepped to him, I was like, man, I'm, Yo, you better, you better do you gotta your go. work. Yeah. Because I'm doing yeah. my worst to you. Straight. Yeah. And I was definitely going to say <laughs> when we got to this, like that moment was so huge because to hear Rev play, at least for me, to hear Rev and my, my crew on the radio, nobody was playing that way. We would get the wake up show syndicated at night and Rev was doing shit that was just still yet for us to learn. He still is. But even back then. So for Spinbad to go against Rev on these records and know that there was really no cuffs, it was like go in, go in and make it as ill as you can make it. I know the the DJ community, the turntable community was hype. You know what I mean? Because oh. who else is going to go against Rev? And then they both, you guys did it twice, right, Rev? Yeah. yeah. Part one and part two. Yeah. Both of those on both sides, it's like how do you decide who won? It was so ill on both parts. And introducing to my left... Repping Queens, New York, DJ Spinbag. And to my right, repping Los Angeles, California, DJ Revolution. Again, it, it's an art form in itself beyond any Red Bull wordplay set you've ever heard. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, wordplay, but also like cut for cut. Nothing yeah. was like similar. It was like worlds apart, but both like murder. Yeah. Don't hurt me, DJ Spin Man. When you see me in the street, you wanna talk it out. It's hard to talk when he's new. In your mouth, your album won't sell. You got one fan. But motherfuckers know my name. From New York to Japan. Fucked up. I murdered you on your own shit. Rev revolution, you a bitch. Get off my, my dick, you a phony. B.I. Pretending you're running your mouth. Now it's time we settle the score. He had his hip hop versus rap, and I had my hip hop versus rap. He wasn't thinking about anyone else putting it together, just him. And, right. and the same thing happened with me. And so when, when we did this, I was like, hey, man, here's the beat. You got two weeks. Mm. You, you, you better do you better do it. You better hook it up because I'm not I'm showing no mercy. You get sliced with some back of your head to ass crack. Your career is over. You might fall off the map. Beat you whack. Fuck that. I'll break your fingers. You don't come back. Speed bad. The punk fag. I'm a bitch like homo. I'm giving you white feet rough sex. Got the little hook to screaming. What's next? Wear that ass out in front of your kids and your butt. See boy lover. Take that motherfucker. I was working on my, my first album. Well, it's actually my second album, um, Toys We Trust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had always wanted to to do like a DJ battle on one beat, you mm -hmm. know, not like Battle on Wax or some whack 80s shit like that. It was like, um, you know, like I needed to, for me, I needed to see if it was possible to pull off and who who could I get that would even understand the mentality it takes to approach this? Like, right. you got to have a lot of runway already just uh, to even think about shit on that level. Yeah, because everything you guys do is so calculated, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you no, you you have to couple you have to think a couple of steps in advance mm -hmm. when you're laying it down. Like, what cut's going to come next? What word's going to come next? But anyway, the origin was like I wanted to set it up like a fake boxing match, you know. Because I needed some context because I was trying to present this in a way I've always and, and this is the, another way me and him were similar is like presenting our take on things in a package that's digestible by the general hip hop community. Mm -hmm. Right. So, again, Spin made those weird crazy 80s records acceptable because he packaged them right yeah. and, 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 the, and the concept was right so i had to do the same thing with turntablism and dj battling because of if it was just two dudes just scratching the shit out of some records man <laughs> like that's not gonna be i mean even back then that's like eh. even for me i'm you can miss me with all that but if you make it exciting and give it a package and you you turn it into a, a theme it's much more digestible and will live a lot longer. And to me, there was nobody else that could fit those shoes. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I talked to him about it and he was with it, but I was like, man, you don't, I, I mean, I hope you know, like it's really some real <laughs> shit. Like I want you to, in order for this, in, in order for this to work, and and make it look like we, like a real, you have to come at me, right? yeah, yeah. and I have to come at you. So you practice up, get your shit together. And lay it down. And here's here's the here's what I want. I want four bars, 
Then I want two bars and then I want one bar of just scratching. And then I'm going to have an announcer come in, set it up. And I had Sway and King Tech involved and everybody and a bunch of guys that worked at the beat. I would just be pulling people into the, the studio, the B studio and say, hey, say this. And then, hey, come here. You, you know, hey, come over here. You're going to be you're about to be the ring announcer. I just threw it all together for the first one because it was, it was an experiment. I didn't even know if it was going to work. It mm-hmm. could have come out sounding like shit. But the way he fucked me up on that and like the way I had to come back and like because it's weird because the first time I sent him my I fucked up, man. I sent him my piece because oh, he was like, man, I need some inspiration. I'm, I'm kind of I've never done anything. Oh, like that before. So that's how he knew I, I fucked up man. I sent him. Uh, I don't know if it was the whole piece, but just to give him an idea, like I, mm-hmm. I sent him like the couple of bars of scratches and a couple of pieces of the wordplay that I had put together. I think it was almost the whole thing. And so he called me back and said, oh, I got it now. <laughs> oh, I bet you do, motherfucker. Yeah. I bet you do. And he did. And, you know, that's what I wanted, though. You know, and I, I wanted him to do his absolute worst to really make it something like you guys are talking about, like who won, who, who, like, what is that? I don't even know what this is and mission accomplished. And then it was, it was such a thing that we, I definitely had to do it again. And the second one was even crazier. What was the time process like to, to make these mixtapes for, for spin bad and for you guys as well, when you guys were putting these things together, I mean, with the four track, I've, I've worked with the four track before and it's tedious. You know what I mean? Especially when you're, when you're doing a mix and you're layering it like that, like you could literally spend two hours on the first Uh, five minutes. You know what I mean? Like, or more. Um, your, Your whole mind is firing on all cylinders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, reworking this shit while you're laying it down, then you're going back and erasing it and bouncing it to another track and doing right. all kinds of other stuff. Now it was definitely more of a, a physical um, thing when you were working with an actual cassette, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. or real. Yeah. Because in Ableton or Logic or Pro Tools, man, you just you honestly you cut your time probably almost by eighty percent because eighty percent of that shit is rewind. Hit yep. play, hit record, punch in, get it right. Oh, okay, we got it. And then move to the next one and so on and so on. And now it's more like hit the space bar, go back, punch in, mm-hmm. hit the space bar, go back. And you can yeah. see it too. So it helped being able to like visually see the waveforms when you're doing shit like that. You can kind of put everything on the grid. You can move shit around. Yeah, there's so much more that you could do. But like I did nine five classics with Sat on a four track. It's it's tedious. I mean, it's yeah. like hours and hours and hours for just a 45 minute mix. I bought my first Mac computer for the sole purpose to do multi track recording. Mm-hmm. After hearing Spins mix, of course, then I did a series of mixtapes where they were multi tracked, and my multi tracking wasn't nowhere near as intense as his. It was like record the mix, do some layers, punch in, clean mm-hmm. shit up, throw movie clips, throw drops in. You know, and even that would take a, a, a couple of days, you know what I mean, of me just like, okay, I'm exhausted of dealing with this. I need to come come back to it. Mm-hmm. But that's what I'm saying. Like, it's an art form. It's like painting a painting, you know? You know what I'm saying? You might not paint the whole joint in a day, but you got to do these layers and then come back. And, and then eventually you get this masterpiece that's just – you never want to do it again until you see you get the response from the people and you're yeah. like, all right, it's time. If you go back in time, even before our generation, even before like Jeff and all those guys, you go and watch like what the Latin Rascals were doing in the studio with tape edits. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? I show that to my students all the time because they got the luxury of a computer and Ableton and all yeah. that. These dudes were taking razor blades and slicing like cutting and tape, tape, you know, wow. it, doing it multiple times. And oh my God. Up, pacing up pieces the pasting up pieces of a tape on the wall, like here's a kick, boom, here's a snare, boom, here's a hi-hat, boom. And then they would move it around and splice it. Oh, and sure. I don't know how much coke and how much time it took them to do it. <laughs> so <laughs> much Adderall, bro. Yeah, man. Yeah. I think Spin Bad, I think he was recording some of it in Philly for part two. So I think he was at Larry Gold's doing some of it. And... I remember them being in there for hours and that was just him doing some of the mix. Right. You know? So it's 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 work, man. I mean, but some, again, this is something yeah. that's like a lifetime. It's like no mm-hmm. you know, generations are gonna be talking about mixes like this, you know. You know, back then everybody had like a killer intro before you actually start. Yeah. yeah. You know, you gotta show your ass for like that one minute, thirty seconds. Mm-hmm. On the spin bed did on nine one nine hundred spin bed, I think. It was almost like a three, four minute intro. 
you know, he just put so much time to the point where, like, some mixes will take him sometimes six months. It's just that you just come back to it. Like, like yeah. um, I was saying, yeah. you got to, you know, clear your brain and then come back to it. You know, I, I remember trying to make my first mixtape on a on a on a four track and then trying to do that intro. That intro took me like a week. <clears throat> oh, and it, right. it was just like a one minute intro with scratches from different things. But it was literally like it was production. It was like producing an album in, in some yeah. respects when you do it on a four track to the point where I was like, yo, I'm not doing the rest of the mixtape like this. I'm just going to, you know. And then after you do that intro, you're like an engineer because you have to like know which scratches mm-hmm. and which layers and which tracks were on which, and you have to dump it live to like a mini disc or at the time that I was using, yeah. you know what I mean? I will say this. Um, if you stay sharp at it, just like anything else, and you keep doing it no matter how hard it is, mm-hmm. and you keep pushing it and you, you jump from technology to technology, then it never goes away and you're able to figure it out a lot quicker and port whatever knowledge you take from your yeah. four track or whatever and dump it into Ableton for sure. and you're able to get it done that much quicker. And for me, it was always, you know, not just the mixtapes. I've always, you know, put out the records. I was always trying to do mixes for the radio. I did like hundreds of features on so many different artists, you know, for scratch hooks that I've always been living in that world where shit is constantly kicking around in my mind. And I think somebody like Spin had the same thing. You know, you just... It's like, again, I revert to like some Rain Man shit. It's just like, it's just there. And when the time ha- comes for you to let it out, it just kind of, you need to be in your zone. But once you get in that zone, there it is. And it just kind of materializes, you know? Cause I'll be sitting there in the studio trying to figure out like, somebody will just give me a three verses, just rapidy raps. Like, here you go, here's my shit, fix it, hook up. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? And so that's when that kind of shit starts kicking around. Like you get in your little weird zone. I think every DJ that does that multi-tracking or wordplay shit has some some switch that they flip in their head and it just kind of happens. But you got to stay sharp at it. And it's just like anything. You got to keep chiseling away. And it, eventually you get to a point where it isn't that hard. It isn't that tedious. And it just kind of comes naturally. Now, did you ever do this? Because I always wondered. Like, I know Spin did it also. He used to write down. Like, I mean, we'd be in the car just. Oh, just, hell yeah. And then you would hear a certain part of a rap song like, oh, I could use that. I could use that. To the oh. point where like, a whole bunch of little post-it pads with, you know, with daggers from, from different rap songs. Oh, definitely. I remember doing like when I was crafting up my first ones i remember i used to i worked at a fast food shop in the mall and when i wasn't you know when i was like when there was no customers i had a sheet like a notebook and i'd just be banging around things in my head and like oh i'm gonna use this from this one. Oh, and you know i'll be listening to something in my headphone like, oh i'm definitely taking that line and i would write it and then as the digital vinyl thing happened i didn't have to write it down anymore i would just record it and put them all in a folder so i would all have them as like a database they were actually there because they weren't in my head anymore. I could actually just access them instantly and see if they worked right away. So yeah, I used to write stuff down until until I got to the point where I had so much shit written down, I couldn't even make any sense of it. <laughs> so uh, it just became a big mess of like weird. Uh, it's like someone would discover this like later on and be like, what the fuck was this guy thinking? What is all this? This, is, <laughs> this shit is a mess. Yeah. All these different phrases from different rap songs. I had a pad, you know, for, you know, I just called it intro, you know, intro elements or whatever. And then after a while, when we got into more, you know, different technologies, I would have, like, I would have a file on my BlackBerry. So if I'm just driving around or walking around, I would hear something, I'd write inside the BlackBerry. Wow. But yeah, like, after a while, it became so much to, 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 sh- to sift through. Even like, when you got time to do an intro, you just came up with new stuff anyway, because <laughs> going to all would be too, too bad. Nick. Yeah, I mean, I, I've come up with a pretty good way to keep it straight in my head and it does require some diligence and it requires um you know you you got to stay on it but i've databased all this stuff and um, oh it's pretty easy for me to access when i'm looking for a word right. i can do a couple of things and the shit will pop up wow. for me Dude, all the stuff that all these songs that have this one phrase in there this one word in it but it required a lot to get that done but obviously you remember everything with your name in it like Anything that would say revolution. I knew every record that had an A or a V. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, things like that stick out. You don't need to write those down. And then, you know what's crazy? I'll be, I, man, especially with a lot of my newer students, man, I'll hear their their new DJ name that they got in a record that's out. And I'll hear it, and they won't even hear it. They'll just pass oh. that shit by like it was nothing. <laughs> but, hey, you heard that, right? And they were like, 
what? What are you talking about? Well, I just said your name. Use that. And they'll be like, what do you mean? Use that. <laughs> Did Spinbad enjoy making like the mixtapes? Did he want to do production more? Did he want to like kind of do clubs more? Like what was his, his shit? The opportunities just kept on coming. And um, I mean, yeah, the mixtapes were great because obviously it was lucrative at the time. Yeah. But it kind of got, it was like a buzzkill when, you know, a lot of the clown DJs would just kind of ruin the whole the whole landscape of the, the you know, the profit margin and shit. So he kind of transitioned to the radio stuff, which was, oh, just as good because that, that also leaked into the clubs. Mm-hmm. But I think what he really, I think, enjoyed mostly was being on the road. It was also like, I think he did some weird stuff where since he had the Z100 affiliation, he would do shows with like Backstreet Boys, Gwen Stefani. Um, I mean, I think there's actually a David Letterman clip where, yeah, it was Moby and Gwen and Spinbad was doing the cuts in the background. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, he really liked the road stuff. Production, he dabbled every so often, but it was really the road stuff I think he liked. Uh, every time I talked to him, especially um, later on, I would always tell him, yo, man, like, you got to start getting into this production shit, man. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's longevity, man. It's, it's legacy shit. You know, like, who, who knows how long any of us are going to last in this shit? And we always, you know, felt three steps away from just being busted ass broke. Because that's just how it was when we came up. You know, it wasn't a real thing. It wasn't like a legit job. It wasn't, you know, the whole family clowned on you. Your whole high school class clowned on you. Like, you would be a DJ. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I always felt like, well, shit, man. Maybe there's something to that. I'm, I'm, I need to learn as much as I can. So I'm not going to be a battle DJ. I'm not going to be this. I'm not going to be put in a box. And I was just to try to tell Spin, like, hey, man, you know should maybe, you know, fuck with logic or you should, you know, get into pro tools and like you learn a little bit more about how to c- construct some music cuz it could help you, man. It could be something that could add to your arsenal and also be a little side hustle for you. And you know, it just never materialized. Yeah, cuz I feel like he was on the road with Russell Peters. I mean, he was Russell Peters, the comedian's uh DJ and Russell Peters is like he he loves DJing. He can actually throw down. I, I've seen him scratch it a little bit. I remember I was in Vegas and he just hopped on. And I was like, oh shit! Like this motherfucker <laughs> can scratch. He scratched better than me actually. <laughs> but yeah, I would always see him on tour. So I was gonna. I was wondering if he just loved being on the road and he just loved touring I mean, that, and shit. You know, that was an amazing job working for Russell. Like, I mean, that's the best boss to have. Yeah, right? I was gonna yeah. say like that is just. Uh, if you're gonna be on the road, there's a different level to being on the road. When you're in the road with Russell, you're in the <laughs> Yeah, you're you're, you're at a level that isn't quite enjoyable. That's not my, my, those are not my road experiences. <laughs> I was going to say, Rev, Rev told me some stories about his road experience that are definitely not like uh, no. Spin and Russell's road experience. I got to hear. I got to hear. I got to hear everything. Yeah, I mean, how can you not love being on, on the road with somebody like that and having, you know, the things that you're able to have when you're rolling around with somebody like that? And it's not just money or status or whatever. It's because of the dude, because of Russell. Right. You know, like right. it's, that's a, it's a genuine yeah. dude, and he comes from where we come from. So it's just rolling around with the homie mm-hmm. and having a, having a ball, and you work a little bit. You know what I mean? For me, yeah. and for most people, even if you're DJing for a major artist, it's a lot of work, man. And yeah. it's, a lot it's of not pressure. as glamorous as it seems. A lot yeah. of pressure touring with an artist, you know, which I've done, and you know. Um, touring by myself i'm you know i'll just get on a plane and you know get dropped off in some foreign country for three and then i'll be three, 10 different countries in three weeks Ew. by myself you know what i mean and it's it's not the same experience and right what i still loved it to the point where i just kept going back and doing it so yeah. i love yeah. those experiences obviously when you get into a lane where you can have you know the the next tier of experience you how could you not love it you know what yeah. I mean? how did they link up how did russell peters and, and spin bat link up well the crazy part was that okay so russell before he became the huge sensation that you know, he is now he was like you know he was on the grind doing like chilling circuit clubs and stuff like that so he was on the road just trying to do little comedy clubs and to pass the time on all these these long plane rides or these long train rides or bus rides, he would stop in a place like Fat Beats LA or, you know, Fat Beats in, in New York and buy whatever was on the mixtape rack. Mm. And, you know, he'd pick up the baboos, the revolutions, or, you know, like he picked up all the hot shit and he learned, oh my God, this guy's dope, this guy's dope. And then I guess and, and somewhere in his head, he, he vowed like, yo, if I could ever make it, I'm going to structure my stage show to have some of the best DJs behind me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, he, you know, he bought a spin bad tape and he kept in touch with him as, you know, his career excelled. And when it got to the point where, 
it was good, he was like, yo, I'm going to have a state show with two turntables. I want you to be one of my DJs and, and made it happen. And every state he would stop at, he would know in Cali, oh, I'm going to call this cat. I'm going to call this person. So he respects every DJ because he knows the grind. Yeah, know? he Part really loves, he really he respects and loves the craft of DJing. You can tell, like Russell. Yeah. yeah. He respects the old school DJs as well, like the yeah. old school hip hop. Period. Yeah, and then like yeah. his big brother's a DJ or was a DJ. Russell's big brother was a DJ. That's that's kind of oh, what yeah. yeah. we're talking about. Also, was the quality of life while being on the road. Russell, yeah. being who he is he makes sure you have the best turntables, the best the mixer that came out maybe like last month. You know what I'm saying? So we <laughs> do the other shows or whatever, and we show up. We put whatever on the rider. We show up. It might not be there. When you work with Russell, it's going to be there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The worst part about touring with Russell is having to go on his long shopping trips. Yeah, while Russell spends an extensive amount of money, and you just got a window shop, you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> but yeah, like Rev said a minute ago, like I met Russell through Spin, same same as Rev, you know, you know what I mean. Like I didn't even know who Russell was, and then uh, Spin was like, "Yeah, you got to link up with my man um, Russell out there. He he lives out there now." And I'm like, "Well, who the who the fuck is Russell?" And he's like, "Yeah, Russell Peters, a comedian." I'm like, "You want me to go hang out with a comedian?" I'm like I don't. Hang out with this. This is LA, bro. There's a million comedians out here, and I don't hang with <laughs> any of them. Why? Why? Why should I go? Why should I check with this guy? He's like, oh man, he's a DJ. I've been fucking with him for a couple of years, and I was like, I was still suspect about it. Like, man, come on, dog. I, I don't know, man. <laughs> but but if you say so, all right, cool. And you know, it was obviously it was because of spin. It was it was like if somebody else had recommended me to go see this guy, I've been like, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Whatever. I mean, that was my same experience too, because I didn't know. I mean, I actually didn't know who Russell was, and he was doing a performance in Long Island, and then Spend was like, "Yo, let's go check out my homeboy. He's doing a show out here." And then you know, got you know, watch the show. It's funny. Then after the show, we were backstage, and then Spend was like, "Hey, what's up, man? Yo, this, this is my man AV. Um, this is Russell Peters." And just right out on the spot, Russell starts rattling off the name of my mixtape. This is the first time I'm meeting this guy. Wow. And I'm like, "What the fuck? How, how do you know my collection?" And he's like, "Yo." And he explained to me, like, when he was on the road, he bought tape. And he learned who had what, who, who didn't have any skills or whatever. And from that point on, I was like, wow, this guy's real. Man, he's deep in it, man. Russell is way deep in it. You know, looking back, what what are your fondest memories that you have of, of Spin Bad? I mean, somebody asked me this the other day. I was doing this thing called The Questions Hip Hop and, uh, like, this Instagram. Like, oh, yeah. Show, right? yeah. So they asked me the same thing. And uh, there isn't, like, a there isn't a bad memory with, with this guy, you know, this yeah. guy was such a good dude and he was hilarious all the time, no matter what was going on. It was just something, something about him, but being, uh, I mean, there's so many, I, I can't, I couldn't even begin, you know, the fun, some of the funniest memories are when we were down in like at these mix show power summits. Cause we would just all be bugging out and just like, there's just no old bar and everybody's just getting, drunk and it's all on the record labels dime and we just remember <laughs> all the all the all the uh, artists down there so we would just wild out man i remember man x were you with me man i got the photos me? dog i got the was photos it, it was me <laughs> you yo okay so that was the yo was that the night that we met with yes Kanye yes was in the gym? yes so we got yes. in the, we got in the, yeah okay it's me and you rev yeah i know i see it Damn, so yo. we were in Puerto Rico, and so me and Spin and X were going back to some, oh, I don't know who it was. They had a set of 12s in there. We just wanted to cut it up, man, and just, you know, have some drinks what, and shit. Wait, what, wow. this was a summit? What was this? Yeah, it's a mix show power summit. So basically, it's all the record labels would fly all the top DJs from around the country or even the world to one place to show off new music, Some sometimes be new gear. Um, let's just, you know, like a convention um, with a lot of fuckery. <laughs> um, so uh so, but anyway uh so we are going back it was like after all the parties are done and we're going somebody was like yo we're big fans it was me and x and spin and and uh they were like yo we got a set of a 12s come back to the room we cut it up and have some drinks all right cool so we get in this zip, like tramway like zip line thing and i i get in there and i'm i look i look to my left and i was like oh shit it's kanye what's up man how's it going <laughs> you know we had met a, a couple of times and this is right before his album had come out. This is summer before his first album on Def Jam came out. And he had been talking to us about it. And I, he, I'd been on the phone with him uh, once or twice. And he was telling me about all this shit. He, was, he would spit his raps to me on the phone, which I didn't even know he rapped. So he got, I get in this tramway. We're all looking around like, 
this is weird. You know, like we're, <laughs> we're in Puerto Rico, we're all to be like, what, what's happening here? So we get down to the bottom of this thing. We go into this hotel room and there's a fucking set of decks and we just cut it up for hours. I, I was going to say that's probably one of my more like moments that I remember. And that was 03, 04, I yeah, think. Yeah, a long time ago, yeah. And I, the uh, next one after that is where me and him got super lit and, dr and drove uh, rental <laughs> scooters around the Baham Nassau Bahamas Island. And I crashed my scooter because we pulled up on, we pulled up to the club on scooters. <laughs> <laughs> and I crashed my scooter into a tree. And he just never let me hear the end of it, man. Wow. You know, man, like these, these conventions were like crazy because, you know, depending on what level you were at the radio, you had to find a sponsor to cover you to go, right? So some of the D, you know, the DJs, the top tier guys, they didn't have to worry. They were already a shoe in. But if you were not, you kind of had to go to the record labels and figure out who was going to sponsor you to go to this thing. And they had club gigs too. Like I remember spinning a Missy Elliott album release party with vinyl down in Puerto Rico. It was like me and Tony Touch or something like that. You would go to this convention. You'd stay at a hotel. This was at the Westin in Puerto Rico that year. And everybody was there. You were arm's length. Like Con another Kanye story is him and I were in an elevator together and I had the stash Air Maxes on and I had a big Jesus piece and all that shit. And we were like having a discussion about sneakers and jewelry and all this other stuff. Uh, Busta was there. Like artists, they'd stay on the property with you. So it wasn't on some weird shit. You could get drops. You could get photos. And of course, the record labels had vinyl releases, like promo releases that people would try to hunt down to get because that's what you brought back home. On top of the gifts, you'd get flight cases. You'd get needles. They'd have all types of stuff. You would leave there with a good amount of goods that you went back home. And the one year, this may have been the Puerto Rico year, I think 50 Cent in the club. Yeah, that was or it. Or maybe like Wankster or something like that was the big record. No one had it yet, but the record label brought it. And we were on a mission, like most of us were on a mission hunting down <laughs> who was going to get a copy of Wankster to bring back home because you had it on the radio before the next guy that meant a lot you know mm -hmm. what i mean so it was just nuts and then of course like everybody clicked up so me rev spin anyone that was on our kind of like vibe we clicked up and i think honestly it was just us three for the most most part yeah and then a lot of the midwest dudes clicked up and they did their own thing and you know west coast dudes did their own thing and you could go to the events or not go to the events they had like a scarface party at some mansion. You you remember that? They had like oh, a yeah. big dinner mm -hmm. for that Scarface release or whatever. Yep. And uh this shit was fun. It was it was crazy. <laughs> There's some other stuff I can't really discuss because I don't think it's legal. <laughs> but there was some <laughs> shit that I like tarnish this fine podcast. Uh, yeah, I had I had to I had please to, please tarnish it. There's there's nothing <laughs> respectable. <laughs> uh yeah, no, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I think it would incriminate some people, so I, I don't want to have to get into that. But there was definitely some wild ass shit that went on. Av, what about your fondest uh, memory? Um, I mean, like, I, I mean, I guess I kind of got spoiled because I mean, being in New York with him, like a lot of the gigs he did in New York, you know, I was just like the wingman, you know, I was always there. But it was just like the funny moments of you know outside the music stuff because. Mm -hmm. You know, he used to just cut up and just like we used to just snap on people, and sometimes <laughs> the snap sessions would just be like just it would just be cycles, you know. So like it would start off with some like one little tiny joke, and it would just keep on just going to different levels. And I don't know, it was just I don't know, just personal goofy childish stuff. But um, yeah, I definitely missed the the, the the humor, man. That's that's definitely the, what I'm gonna miss the most. Is there one thing? I mean, I'm sure there's a few, but is there one really important thing that you would want people to remember Spinbad for? I mean, I think if anything, it was just his 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 music, his work speaks for itself. That's yeah. what you want to remember him for, you know? That was what he would want you to remember him for, you know what I mean? Because he put so much time and dedication, and that's where the legacy lives, you know? That's where the younger uh, disc, disc jockey that doesn't really have a direction yet doesn't understand what's what, you know, wants to get into turn turntables, do more than just, you know, play music off a computer. Like that's where the art form 
displays itself, you know, in one of its best examples. So I think that's that's what you need to look to, you know, as far as who Spin was, you know. His personality was great. Again, like A said, there's no there's no negative to him at all. You know what I mean? And, and him and I had discussions, you know, when AIM, when Instant Messenger was the thing, like we would all talk for hours, you know, all day long. And he traveled the world before I did. So I spent a lot of time just picking his brain about what it's like. Cause when I was younger, I wanted to travel and I wasn't traveling yet. I was just playing local stuff. Mm -hmm. So just asking everything I can possibly ask how to get around the world. How do you get in contact? How do you do this? You know? And odd, oddly enough, you know, when he passed, like one of the clubs that him and I played uh, abroad, you know, the dude was like, yo, like I booked you off of his referral, you know, and that I would always ask him like, who's someone I should bring out here. And you were one of the first person that he mentioned and then him and I got cool because I went out there to play. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's something where like it tied the world together, you know, I, obviously they, all the good ones go way too soon, you know, but I don't think, you know, he's never going to be forgotten and his legacy is much deeper than just an eighties mixtape. You know, there's so much yeah. more stuff that he's done for sure. And I think as you start to peel back the layers and dig into who he was and what he's done, you'll see. I mean, that hip hop versus rap thing is is brilliant for the time That's that it was done. You know what I mean? And the joints that he's done with Rev and the radio beefs and 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 just being able to tour with Moby, he was the first person besides Jeff that I knew, you know, personally that toured with someone that wasn't a hip hop act. Right, right. That all kind of opened my eyes and was like, yo, there's more out there than what I thought. You right. know what I mean? Like you would just figure a, 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 a D, DJ toured with an MC, you know what I'm saying? To see this dude tour with somebody else like that, it makes it bigger. It, it, it makes the, 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 the possibility greater, you know? Yeah, yeah. he's definitely not going to be forgotten, for sure. His book ethic also, I mean, if I'm doing something, I just know when I do it, if, like, again, I'm in the room by myself, but I'm like, nah, he'd want me to do it again. He'd want me to do it again, you know? Like, because I'm always thinking about, if I do something and, you know, anybody in this room listens to it, would they, you know, would they accept it? Like, nah, I could do better. And then the way he would just push me to do better, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he always wanted to kind of go against the grain. I remember one time he did this one battle, this Fat Beats battle. Everybody wants to come out and be tough guy. Yo, I could do this behind the leg, all that kind of crap. They call out, next contestant, DJ Spinbad. Everybody's looking around, where's this Spinbad guy? He walks up to the stage holding a pizza box. He's cutting through the crowd, like, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Excuse me, when he gets to the stage, he opens the pizza box, and that's where his records work. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, you, know, you know, he's an Italian guy, you know, Italian Irish. So he's cutting through the, the whole crowd with the pizza box. Nobody realizes that he's the next DJ. And he gets to the stage, pulls out the records, and everybody just starts cracking up. And he, he ends up murdering that whole battle anyway. But his entry to the stage was just, to me, that was, like, historical. You know, when, uh, what you were saying, if if you're in a room and in your, your zone, you think about who – is pushing you to do things better and why, you know, like, man, would, would you know, what would, would premiere like this or whatever? It was always like, hmm, would spin bad clown the shit out of me? <laughs> <laughs> because literally, he would, if it was whack, I knew he was going to clown the shit out of me for sure. And, you know, some guys like, there's this, there's this like thing of reverence where you're like, man, it has to be to their level. I know Premier is not going to like it, or this has got to be up to Jeff's level or whoever my, you know, the, the person is at that moment. Is this going to be as, you know, is this on Kubert's level? It was always like, hmm, I wonder if Spinner would laugh at this like it was corny. <laughs> yeah. And it was like he owned that that unique space in my head where it pushed me in in a way that nobody else did. Yeah, you thought about it. I was like, oh, let me hit the redo button. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was like, oh, he's gonna shit on me for that one. <laughs> I can't put that word in there. He's gonna be like, hey, yo, <laughs> you release it too late or too early. He's gonna say like, yeah, that was a hair off, you know? <laughs> yeah, you don't exactly. Wanna, you don't want to hear that. So it, it's so funny, like how how little I knew of him personally, but everything you guys are saying, I I I could hear in his mixtapes. You know, yeah, his sense of humor, his charisma. 
you know, his work ethic, his style, everything, you know, and just even crossing genres. And I, for me, it was really impactful because I've never heard someone, it wasn't like you wouldn't go down the block, be like, yo, Cindy Lop is dope or like, hey, Mickey's dope. But the way he did it and the way he approached it, you know, even I remember when he was uh, playing Moni Moni and he, the different yes, he was he was switching the different yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was dying yeah. laughing and I was listening to it recently and I'm like, like. The thing with that mixtape that makes it special is that after you've listened to it, when you hear those songs at any other time, you hear them the way they are on the mixtape. <laughs> you hear them with the drops in it. You hear it with the movie clip in it. You hear it replaced. Like, it's just something that'll be there forever. The way he juggles the eye of the tiger shit at the beginning, Roxanne with the Eddie Murphy shit. Like, yep. you just, you hear it. That's it. You know what I mean? Like, man, I can't think of another mixtape that has that kind of feel to it nah, it was, you know it was like it was cinematic it was like the chronic the way he put it together yeah, yeah there, there was definitely some good times and the fact that i was still living in philly and he was in new york and we kind of all went back and forth and there were times that rev would come to philly or a a v would be in philly and we would all connect uh going to new york to go shopping sneakers he was big in the air air forces and like nikes and all that shit so we would constantly just be rapping about kicks and you know, it's 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 a lot of shit that if you didn't grow up in that era, you kind of don't do anymore because of the Internet. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to do any of this shit anymore. You can just kind of do your own thing and live in your own little world. But back then you had to be out in the mix. You had to be in the street, you know, and it was more than just seeing each other in the club. It was kind of just like hanging out when you were in town, you know, so in that host when it would come to town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to do this. And I wanted to do this earlier, but it was just so recent and raw. Yeah. I think with yeah, his yeah. passing. Really yeah. And then, um, but I really wanted to kind of showcase and do a, a, a proper tribute for Spinbad because when he passed, I was, you know, obviously I was definitely like stunt. I was, I was just shocked. Nah, I mean, we were, we were, we were, and still are kind of fucked up yeah. about it. And I talked to a, a V I talked to Rev. Those were the first two people I spoke to. And like, you know, it still kind of doesn't make sense. And it's something that you're hoping is not the case, but we know that it is. And, and, you know, I mean, we lost a lot of people this, this year, but he wasn't one of them that you would think that you would be talking about in, in the past tense, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, and it's, then, it's it's very sad. When when I look at like a bucket list of DJs that we we wanted on this podcast, you know, and it's definitely people that were impactful not only to me personally but to to me in all of DJing. I mean, I you yeah. can hear Spinbad, you know, throughout the two thousands and how he affected and influenced so many DJs. Yeah, and even new DJs now, like younger ones, they don't even know where some of that original, right. you know, those styles and those those concepts and everything came from. Right, and I really wanted to make sure that they knew that he had a big hand in that, and he was a big yeah. influence on that. You know, well, um, it was a it was a lot of um, promoters and a uh, venue owners bucket list guy too. You yeah. know, like a lot of the guys like so we had the good fortune of playing together as like um, you know whether it was like uh, a DJ brought his favorite DJs together, a promoter brought his favorite DJs together. We happened to be those guys and it would, you know, we did three or four gigs where it's me and him playing together. And, um, it's crazy, man. It was just, uh, it was always a, uh, a unique experience and, and crazy fun, but he was one of those guys, like you said, he was a, a bucket list DJ for a mm -hmm. lot of people, you know, to meet, to have play at their party or whatever it is. And, um, yeah, it's definitely uh, a strange thing to be talking about him in the past tense because, it, I mean, honestly, it wasn't even that long ago where we did our last gig when we played together. I saw footage of it. I did um, – so my homie runs his party out of Denver, and um, we played there last summer together. I didn't know there was footage of it. And when I went on to do a guest set on Twitch for his, his party, he, had, he said he had a surprise for me. And uh, I didn't know what that meant. I thought he was going to throw some, I don't even know what that means. As a DJ, I don't know what kind of, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Were you had out backstage where you shouldn't have been? Or what? Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, at the end of my set, he puts this footage up of me and Spin spinning together. It was like five minutes of me and then five minutes of Spin. And it was crazy, man. 
<laughs> just to hear it and watch it in, in replay and see him and see me, I was just, a, it was like a surreal experience to know that the dude wasn't, he's not here anymore, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but it was a good, it was kind of like, that was the moment where I had like a send off in my head. It was like, man, I needed to see that. It was like therapy. I mean, it's, it's really tough for me because like every song I hear is like, I know, I know, I mean, being in a lot of clubs where he was actually doing his sets and his gigs, I know the transitions, you know what I'm saying? To the point where like, you know, as other, other DJ, you don't want to bite the next guy's transitions or the way yeah. he's, so, there's so many things I still wouldn't do right now because I know that's the way he would come out of that record. That's the way he would yeah. go. It was just, that's crazy. I mean, yeah, it's just tough. It's definitely tough. I appreciate all you guys, AVXO, yeah, Revolution, thank you so much for taking this time to sit with us and uh, yeah. speak in memory of one of the greatest, you know, DJ Spinbad. And you all know how to start free. Go! So if you want to watch this episode on YouTube or view some of our older episodes as well, you can go to youtube.com slash roadpodcasts like comment subscribe we post new episodes every thursday every thursday y'all without fail so definitely come check out the new episodes on youtube on thursdays and on fridays on youtube we've been posting our older sunday battles from twitch so jamie and i've been working really hard to get these older battles on youtube for you guys to watch so every friday you can check these older battles on youtube and you can also check the newer battles on Sundays at twitch.tv slash roadpodcast. Make sure to follow us on Twitch and uh, subscribe if you can. We just started a new Tuesday on Twitch as well called Road Tuesdays. Basically, everyone in the crew alternates every week. You could check Never one week, Jamie one week, D-Miles the next week, and myself the next week. Hopefully, you know, we'll start incorporating some of the homies and have them do some guest spots as well on Tuesdays. So definitely check that out. Twitch.tv slash roadpodcast. It's while they go round and round, round we go oh, yeah. two years ago. A friend of mine and Flash is gonna rock your mind. Welcome to the Terradome, the Terradome. I wonder if I take you home. E F F E C T, a cool operator operating correctly. But back in the days, I knew rap would never die. Too late, baby. Bye bye, and I watch it, boy. Head, 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 insane in the membrane. Take the train, take the train. T-H-O-T, man, Hatton keeps on making it, Brooklyn keeps on taking it, we keep coming back with more and more hits, party people, I came through the door, I said it before two years ago, super ho, if my train goes off the track, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up, back, back, back to the grill again, the grill again, friends, how many MCs must get dipped, before somebody says don't with Chris, hey, ho, for moving, don't stop, no Body beats the biz Let's do the dance, call the Pee Wee Herman Hey, Eric Sermon Hey, you, you, get off my cloud Go down, baby, go down, baby The guards must be crazy You ain't fresh, you ain't fresh, yeah